So I've been on YouTube for about 14 years now. When I first started posting, George Bush was president, and now a million people are subscribed to this channel that mainly deals in music memes and arcane music theory. Just how the f did that happen? The first video that I ever posted was in February of 2006, where I was tapping the maple leaf rag on my seven-string Conklin Groove Tools bass guitar. I shot this video on my mom's point-and-shoot camera, which could only shoot four minutes of video at a time, which is part of the reason why I took the tempo of the maple leaf rag so fast. I only had four minutes to work with. I was a big fan at the time, early 2006, of Adam Fulra, a Polish guitarist who was posting these tapped versions of the Maple Leaf Rag and other pieces on his double neck guitar. And so I thought I would try and do similar things. I was posting a lot on mxtabs.net, which hasn't existed for 12 years now. And unfortunately, most of the YouTube videos from this era have actually been deleted. At one point, years later, I just got embarrassed by them, and instead of making them private or unlisted, I deleted them. Which is unfortunate, because that's kind of a part of my history. The first lesson in all of this is to never delete anything unless you have a backup. Take archival seriously. You know, MySpace lost all of the music that had been uploaded to its servers during this time frame, and that is honestly a huge loss of history. I really wish I didn't delete those videos. Oh well. <laughs> Like anybody and everybody inspired by the original canon rock, yes, I'm really dating myself with this reference, I was swept up in the wave of people posting Baroque and classical compositions performed on electric instruments, which was a very popular genre of YouTube video in like the late 2000s or so. But in addition to this, I was also posting these like little lessons that I was shooting on my even then, fairly outdated 2006 MacBook Pro webcam. The mode of it retrograde, so the mode of backwards, the mode of it retrograde inversion, so it goes backwards and is upside down, mode of it in the rhythmic augmentation, so all the note values are doubled, rhythmic a diminution. All now, there's only have. been one cultural study done of YouTube music education, and that can be found in a couple of chapters from the 2012 book Playing Along by Kerry Miller. Its references are fairly old, to be honest. At one point it talks about a teacher, quote, disabling the star rating function on a video. So yeah, we are talking ancient history here, but it does a pretty good job of describing how music education worked on YouTube back in the day. Miller calls the style A to A, or amateur to amateur education. Musicians of varying degrees of education uploading fairly haphazard DIY lessons for free to YouTube, and then creating communities around these lessons based on a culture of participation. I was part of this A to A, amateur to amateur scene, in a way. I was going to Berklee College of Music at the time for jazz composition, and I was uploading these videos on topics of jazz improvisation and bass performance. And this is the most important step. We're going to analyze these notes. The production quality of these early videos is just absolutely abysmal, but it did give me good experience talking to a camera and also figuring out what kinds of things people might like in YouTube videos. It was a small community, but there were a couple of other people working at the time, like Thomas Rizel, aka Marlo DK, as well as Scott Devine, who would eventually create Scott's Bass Lessons. But I kind of found like this little space in early YouTube for me, which was great because I love learning about music. I love teaching music. Lesson two is to know the space that you're creating for and know what other people are doing in that space transcribe other people's work, kind of the same way that a jazz musician might transcribe a good solo. Which brings me to the third era of YouTube. It was around this time where I noticed a lot of people started making livings for themselves, creating viral content on YouTube. And I thought, 
Uh, I could probably do something like that. So I tried a bunch of different things, like for example, beatboxing and playing Billie Jean on bass guitar at the same time. That video is fun and goofy, but it really didn't get me anywhere. I also tried doing jazz covers of pop songs, actually several years before Postmodern Jukebox created their whole brand identity around it. These videos didn't really do all that well either, but you do have uh, Sungazer Sean Crowder in a stylish hat, so that's nice. Look at you go, Sean. I was and I am a fan of Jack Conti and Natalie Dawn's band Pomplamoose, who at the time were growing very quickly because of their video songs. These were, I guess, music videos where you could see every musical element that you heard actually represented some way on screen. Their concept of video song, where you're seeing everything that you're hearing in a given recording, was revolutionary to how music performance was being represented in video, especially on YouTube. It was deeply influential to the modern YouTube style. So I saw what they were doing with their covers, and I tried my hand at it, doing a jazz pop fusion reharmonization of Britney Spears' Till the World Ends. Yeah, I've been doing those jazz pop fusion reharmonizations for for a while now, and uh, no, no, that did not go viral. I started trying other things, though, because I saw that people who posted regular content, whether it's lessons or music videos or vlogs or whatever, generally grew pretty quickly. So in 2013, I started doing a regular weekly Monday upload of bass lessons. And yeah, that uh, facial hair is very unfortunate. But at the end of the day, all of these flailing attempts at viral success on YouTube and social media ultimately completely failed. So the lesson here is that even if you are early to the game and you try very hard, that's no guarantee of success. Some of your ideas might just lead to a dead end. Now, in retrospect, I know why these early attempts failed. The production quality just did not keep up with the times at all. Some of the videos aren't very good. And even though I made some higher quality explainer type videos at the time, I just didn't do it with any degree of consistency. So that viral success that I wanted just didn't come. But that would soon change. Here's an idea, here's an idea, here's an idea. Now, I was a huge fan of PBS Idea Channel with host Mike Rugnetta. It was a tightly scripted and edited show with animations that dealt with digital media literacy and philosophy and pop culture and memes. The answer isn't yes, but neither is it a simple no. I thought to myself, yeah, like, what about that, but for bass? And so in July of 2015, I released my first Adam Neely's Bass Lessons. Uh, I forgot how much I liked that, uh, that intro. I should maybe bring that back at some point. Anyway. <clears throat> Early topics focused on some rather mundane things like pinky finger strength, for example. More than enough strength to actually deliver the force into the bass through the pinky finger. But there were other more esoteric subjects like playing Bartok string quartets on bass guitar and <laughs> uh, probably my favorite title that I've ever titled any of my videos. Um, <clears throat> Nietzsche's Guide to Bass Guitar. And the Dionysian ideal, romantic thinking. I very quickly figured out that it wasn't just bassists watching. Plenty of non-bassists and also even non-musicians were watching my channel now. And so I felt like I could expand out to explore other things in music besides just bass. Like the avant-garde music of Conlon Nancro, for example. Or how rhythm and harmony are essentially the same thing in my video on harmonic polyrhythms. But then we speed it up. We're gonna probably get a major chord, right? Right? Let's see. Sure enough, major chord. With this explainer format that I had liberally borrowed from other YouTube channels, I found that I could explore really anything in music that I wanted to, and that was really exciting at the time. Any topic weird or otherwise in music was fair game, and that was enormously liberating. It felt like I finally started to find my voice on this platform. <laughs> It of course took, you know, 10 years of trial and error, but I was starting to do it. Now in the late fall of 2016, the great 
algorithm shift, as I'm gonna call it, happened. Larger YouTubers started having their videos not recommended to as many people and started losing many, many viewers. But the flip side of this is that smaller creators like myself at the time started getting their videos very, very rapidly promoted to people. Like the sidebar started being spammed with my videos. There's one video in particular, a fairly snarky one entitled, How and Why Classical Musicians Feel Rhythm Differently, that kind of went viral. And this was like nine months after it had first been published. And I had been on YouTube already for a decade. Now in the traditional pop music scene, you have maybe a couple of months to replicate the success of a breakout single. On social media, it's more like a week. Now, very fortunately, I was prepared and I knew exactly what to do, so I released the video, The Music Theory of Vaporwave, and that did very well. It seems like I could actually create a career for myself on YouTube now. I started doing regular Q&A videos around this time, just, you know, to try and build up the community that had started around this channel. And by 2017, I had started making enough money through ad revenue and also a nascent Patreon that I started, I don't know, maybe considering that this YouTube thing might actually work out as a full-time career for myself. But at the time, I still was mainly supporting myself as a working musician here in New York City. I originally moved to New York to go to the Manhattan School of Music for grad school, but throughout that time I was gigging, playing weddings and corporate events and all kinds of things, really. I started filming these gigs somewhat surreptitiously and turned them into gig vlogs, kind of like first-person documentaries exploring the lives of working musicians and how they rehearse and how they schlep gear and how they perform. Figure out what's happening with uh, Can't Heat. Oh. <laughs> Music theorist William O'Hara uses the term techne to reference how musicians show the process of music making on YouTube. It's the process of showing the musical labor as part of the art itself, which is actually similar to Pomplamoose's term video song. We're experiencing the how of music through video. I think of these gig vlogs as kind of like a form of techne. You're seeing the music as it's conceived and performed. Yeah, just do your thing. Da -da 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 -da. Like, bring us in yeah, in obvious like, place. Have you ever seen the movie Whiplash? Oh, dude. <laughs> and then you hear it performed. I've had people in the comments section say that these are edited kind of like heist movies. Like, you first see the criminals planning the crime. I'll count it off at the exact same tempo as this next tune, Is You Is. So basically, it's like dee dee doo 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 And then interspersed with this planning, you're seeing the crime actually being performed. And then I literally might go one, two, three, four, bum, bum, bum. I wanted to use these vlogs to demystify the process of music making. So where you at starts with a big F5 pattern. Yeah, I put watch. Is um, that counting it or you? For many people, music is this just mysterious thing that just happens. But there is so much that goes on on a technical level, and I wanted to illuminate some of that stuff through storytelling. Storytelling to me is very similar to music, in that it's all about setting up expectations and then either meeting them or subverting them. Kind of like this whole device of me wandering around Brooklyn. Now for me, storytelling is incredibly important for communicating ideas through visual media like YouTube. And I've also found that narrative and storytelling devices are way more effective at inspiring than the mere delivery of information can ever be. No lick that time, expectations subverted. In the past couple of years, I've explored many different kinds of music and I've done that in a number of different ways. I explored music and language in my video on Scotch snaps in hip hop. I took part in a study on improvisers and how they perceive harmonic structures. That was a fun video to make. I've started some really weird memes in the pursuit of music education, like with my 7-Eleven video, where I explore how to break down and perform a 7 against 11 polyrhythm, while at the same time inducing kind of this deep fried fever 
dream. I did a gig with the J Music Ensemble and then interviewed their frontman Patrick Bartley on the relationship of American jazz music to Japanese music. It's a simultaneous feeling of the optimistic rhythm with the really melancholy melody. And that's what creates that feeling of J-pop that has, and it's very deep. I made a video on the history of U.S. jazz diplomacy while I was actually serving as a U.S. jazz ambassador, in a sense, while on tour in Kyrgyzstan and Mongolia and part of this program with the U.S. State Department. On that tour, we discovered that there is, in fact, a universal language, and that universal language is Uptown Funk. Uptown Funk is the universal language. You know, this whole thing has been an enormously rewarding experience because it lets me teach and also lets me learn in a way that I probably wouldn't be able to unless I went back and got my doctorate, like a DMA in jazz performance or something. I've been very fortunate to find myself in the position where I can learn and teach by creating video essays on YouTube, something that I don't really need that academic framework for. Some scholars in other disciplines feel similarly about the power of the video essay versus traditional scholarship, like film scholar Eric Faden, who would write in his Manifesto for Critical Media, Traditional scholarship aspires to exhaustion, to be the definitive end-all, be-all, last word on a particular subject. The media stylo, he calls video essays media stylos, he wrote this in 2007, like pre-YouTube, anyway. The media stylo, by contrast, suggests possibilities. It's not the end of scholarly inquiry, it is the beginning. It explores and experiments and is designed just as much to inspire as to convince. In a key difference, the media stylo moves scholarship beyond just creating knowledge and takes on an aesthetic, poetic function. Sometimes I'm called a YouTube music theorist. And while I do very much enjoy music theory, like who doesn't? Who doesn't enjoy analyzing pieces of music and figuring out how they work? I don't really think that my primary focus is music theory. I mean, sure, I'll sometimes do video analyses of songs and things like that, but I feel like, especially considering the history of everything that I've done here on YouTube, I really am more of a music communicator. Kind of think of like science communication, that whole field that you know people like Bill Nye and Carl Sagan and Michio Kaku are part of. Their role is to get people excited about science so that you might have a generation of people growing up to want to be scientists. So I feel like the role of music communication in the world around us is to get people excited about music so people might want to grow up to become musicians as well as music theorists and musicologists and composers and music historians. People who think very critically and very deeply about the music that surrounds us in the world. You know, the tagline for this channel is uh, exploring what music means and what it means to be a musician. And I want to get people really thinking about these deeper questions of music and how we might relate to music and how we might think of ourselves through the lens of music, which is a profoundly cultural thing. I think it's really beautiful to see our many different cultures expressed through music, and making connections with different people through music, I think, is a net win for humanity. I hope it is anyway, because there are now a million people subscribed to this channel, which is just unreal to me. And it's surreal for many reasons. The first reason is, uh, I'm, I'm just editing this on, on my, uh, my computer right here. I, I am a one-man show. I don't have video editors. I don't have script writers. I don't have production assistants. I don't have any of the traditional apparatus that would normally go with a piece of digital media that could potentially go to one million people. That's insane. And with that amount of power, I feel a deep responsibility. So the meme goes. And hopefully, by drawing people closer together through an understanding of music, that is a net win. That is a good thing that could come with that amount of responsibility that I have. And the profound uh, gratitude that I have for having this platform, I, I cannot express enough. So thank you so much for watching, everybody. Thank you, thank you so much for watching and subscribing. It really, truly means a lot to me. Uh, <laughs> 
here is to the next million subscribers and here is to the next 14 years of YouTube. Thank you so much for watching everybody. Thanks guys. <clears throat>